University and college students went back to school this fall. It wasn't as it usually is. No big frosh week or orientation blowouts. But it wasn't nothing either. You might even be surprised to hear that students went back at all rather than doing their studies online. That's because it's a real mashup. Here to give us a sense of what post-secondary life is like right now, we welcome, in London, Ontario, Hope Mahood, a third-year English and Classics student at Western University and coordinating editor of the student newspaper, The Western Gazette. In Orillia, Ontario, Brandon Real Amyot, a third-year political science and media student at Lakehead University. In downtown Toronto, Sophia Zamorano, a first-year engineering student at the University of Toronto, and in the Beaches neighborhood in the provincial capital, there's Akshay Mohan, an international PhD student specializing in mental health at the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources at the U of T, where he's also a teaching assistant and student organizer. And it's great to see some of you again and some of you for the first time, because uh, uh, we did have a few of you on the program, uh, I guess some months ago, to check in, and we thought it would be wise to to see how things are going now that you're, uh, well, I don't know what, four, five, six weeks into your school years. So, Hope, start us off. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Um, it's definitely different than it's ever been before. So, all of my classes personally are online this year. One of my roommates has some classes in person, but it's a whole different experience. Suddenly, I'm spending roughly 12 hours a day on my computer as opposed to in person in classes with my friends which is definitely taking its toll. Taking its toll in what way? 12 hours a day on a computer? Well, I think it's a lot. It's eye strain. It's definitely a mental toll as well. So I think it definitely is taking away from that human connection and it's a little isolating, I'd say. Interesting. Brandon, how about you? Yeah, I would echo those comments. It's definitely been challenging. I'm also on my computer uh, more, more, more of the day than I am doing anything else at this rate. And uh, it, it's strain on the eyes, strain on the back, uh, strain on your wrists when you're typing. Um, there's a lot of elements that just aren't the same. And I don't know that I expected it to be, but I don't think I quite expected it to be like this. And confirming, are you all online all the time for your classes? Yeah, for myself. You are. Okay. Sophia, give us your update if you would. Yeah, for sure. Um, if you would have told me a couple years ago that I was going to be starting my first year of university completely online, I don't think I would have believed it. It's definitely been an adjustment to not only have the transition into university, but also have the transition into online university. Uh, so it's been uh, definitely challenging, but I'm enjoying it. Um, and it's been it's have its ups and downs, but I still love it. It's interesting that you say you're enjoying it. What aspects of it are you enjoying? Um, I guess the first that university comes with and meeting a lot of new people, even if it's online, I still here on residence meeting new people as well. Um, definitely getting to study what I enjoy all the time is a bonus, even though it may be online. Uh, it's still something that I enjoy. And are you in residence or at home? Yeah, I am in residence. You are in residence. Okay. Yes. Are all the rooms in residence filled? There is definitely a lot of empty rooms here. I know we are maintaining just single rooms, no roommates because of COVID restrictions and safety procedures. Um, so it is quite empty, but um, there are still a significant amount of students in residence. Gotcha. Akshay, how about you? How are you managing? Um, I would say overall, it's definitely been an adjustment on the, um, I would say on the positive side of this online university adjustment is not having to commute between the East End to downtown Toronto. Um, it is also easier to be able to switch between different things because mostly all of them are on the computer in the same physical space, which is my home. Um, I think on the negative side, there's definitely this aspect of losing that sense of community and social connection that one naturally has when one is physically co-located in a classroom. And also studying, I think, is extremely hard because um, these natural study groups form when one is in classes which I do not think are forming when one is doing things online. Mm -hmm. uh, Brandon, let me go to you on this angle of the story, because we've had university presidents on this program, we've had college presidents on, uh, you know, rectors, provosts, professors, uh, teaching assistants, you name it, everybody. And, and they have all, at one point or another, acknowledged the added um, mental health issues that arise 
when you spend 12 hours a day in front of screens and have no human contact. So what I want to know from you, Brandon, is have, well, for example, Lakehead and Aurelia, have they put extra mental health support systems in place to help students at this time? I don't know about extra. Uh, the reality is, is that our institutions have anemic funding as it was before the pandemic. And while we've seen uh, just recently an announcement from the provincial government to increase mental health supports, uh, we tend not to see those things actually trickle down to hiring more staff. And uh, for Lakehead, I know that supports are available for me and I'm accessing them, which is great. Um, but it's certainly not the same and it's not uh, the same I, I want to say quality, but that might be unkind uh, of the in-person aspect of, you know, counseling, uh, other mental health support. So the universities and colleges, are, I think, are trying their best to make do with the situation. But uh, it's it's not um, it's not what it should be. Understood. Sophia, based on what you know of your own circumstances and those of others who are living in residence with you at U of T, mm -hmm. if somebody's in trouble, do they have access to extra mental health help? Not that I know of extra, because I'm not too sure of the resources we had in previous years. But I do know that we have uh, quite a few resources that we can access if we ever do need them. I know we have a great residence life team here that is willing to help that I've also accessed myself. And I know that there are support. I just don't know what they compare to in the previous years. Understood. Okay, let's, uh, you know, Hope, uh, you had a piece in the Toronto Star not too long ago, which is pretty good for a university student. So I want to read a little excerpt from that and then come out with a question. Sheldon, can you put this graphic up, please? When classes suddenly switched online in late March, no one pretended the quality of instruction was the same as in the classroom. Students were told to be patient and understanding as their university and professors adjusted to this new normal. But now, months later, nothing has changed, and universities must acknowledge students' losses. Students do not learn as effectively online as they do in person. Now, admittedly, you wrote that a few months ago, and now we're in October. Is anything different now? I would say a couple things are different. So one thing is a lot of the professors I did have who were struggling with that online tradition transition, be it through just not understanding how to run Zoom content or how to run our course website. I think a lot of them have now, if not learned themselves, have gotten teaching assistants or other people to kind of help them out. That said, I would still say it doesn't compare to the in-person experience if only because we're not accessing on-campus services anymore. Ultimately, our tuition pays for so much more than just our in-class instruction. It pays for our recreation center fees. It pays for on-campus study spots like libraries. It pays for access to computers and physical materials in the libraries that now, if not are totally inaccessible to us, are extremely limited. And So I would say even though, sorry, please go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, let me follow up with this because, because in essence, I mean, I heard um, the U of T president, Merrick Gertler, the other day say that uh, he was essentially told on a Friday that they needed to move 6,500 courses online something that would normally take 10 years to do, and they did it over a weekend. So I, I, I presume the students have some sympathy for the task that was at hand for the administration to try to put so much online immediately? Yes, absolutely. And I would say I have so much sympathy for the professors especially. Ultimately, a lot of them were not trained how to use Zoom or how to use any type of online platform before being told to run a course for hundreds of students online. And I think all of them did their best. And I think all of them really did try to bring a really valuable experience to the online platform. Whether or not they were successful in that due to lack of training, I think is another matter entirely. And I don't think we can discount the fact that students did have a drop off in their quality of experience in March. For sure. Actually, help us understand this. Um, from what I understand, some classes happen in real time on Zoom or Skype or whatever, and others, you know, the, the instructor or the professor will record something, put it up there, and students can watch it, you know, whenever they want. How's it working for you? Um, I would say it's been working well. In, I, I would say, um, one, on the technical aspect, as, as the students have also mentioned, um, things are a lot more smoother, and I have not really experienced any significant technical difficulties. Um, I do feel there is a social aspect of the experience that is missing online just because you cannot see everyone's faces 
um, especially the other peer students, and you cannot have real-time conversations with them as used to. Um, personally, for me, um, the notion of a flipped classroom has worked really well. Um, for example, in one course where we have pre-recorded lectures that we watch over the week, and then it's followed by a real-time online component where the focus is less on delivering the material, but the focus is on sharing what people are facing as challenges or questions related to the material. And the professor has been excellent in being able to resolve questions there. Now, Sophia, if you were going into the classroom and you had a question or a concern or a query after the lecture was over, you simply walk up to the professor and you ask him or her. Uh, you can't do that now. So how do you get access to your professors if you need it? That's a good question. We have uh, quite a few platforms that the professors have set up in order to ask questions. Um, we can email them. We contact them through our student portal. Um, many other ways that we can contact them. Similar to Akshay, most of my classes have been delivered through a flipped classroom method where it's on online pre-recorded lectures and then office hours where we can ask questions and have one have dialogue with the professors. Um, and that has also definitely helped a lot whenever any of us have questions. But to be clear, when you need them, you can get access to them? Yes. You can. Okay. Brandon, what's your experience on that? If you need to get to a professor or an instructor, can you? It, it varies, I would say. Uh, I come from an area where broadband isn't always uh, accessible. So even for the student, if you send an email, sometimes it doesn't go through, that sort of thing. Um, generally, my professors are responding within, uh, you know, a few hours, if at most two days. Um, it's certainly challenging when a lot of courses have consolidated. I have a political science course as an example that's being taught between the Thunder Bay and Aurelia campus of my schools or my school. And uh, I think there's about 60 students in the class. So, it, you know, normally what would be a 30 person class is doubled in size and only one professor with no TAs is covering it. So uh, definitely a challenge to respond to everyone. And uh, for myself, most of my courses are asynchronous. So we're not necessarily uh, learning in real time. And that's simply because international students, some of them are still in their home countries. And uh, it's not really fair to expect someone to show up at 3 a.m. for a, uh, a in-person or Zoom class. No, understood. Uh, OK, let's do something really crass here and talk about money. Because, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's no post-secondary institution in the province that has given students any meaningful breaks on tuition and various other fees, uh, despite the fact that the university experience or the college experience is nothing like it would otherwise normally be. Uh, Hope, is that your situation as well? Do you get any break on tuition or fees of any kind? So we do get some break on athletic center fees, being a 25% cut. So they said it was 50% for first semester and then charging full for second semester. Now, this worked out nice for the first bit of the semester, given that our athletic centers were open. And then Western had an outbreak of two student groups, which resulted in at least 70 students catching the virus in the first month of classes. And then our athletic center, with very good reason, shut down. And now our COVID-19 testing clinic has actually moved inside the rec center. So I don't think it's going to be opening up again anytime soon, and yet we are still paying that 50% of the fee. What do you think about that? I don't think it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was never the type of person who would go to the school gym. That said, my roommate was, and my friends were, and ultimately this is a service that has been taken away from them. And there are other services that I'm still paying for that I'm not using. The entire campus uh, buildings management fee Ultimately, I'm not going on campus. All of my courses are online. I'm spending most of my days in my bedroom at the desk in my room. And ultimately, that's a good $100 I'm paying toward the upkeep of something that I'm not using. You're not using it, but they still need to maintain it. Does that argument have any sway for you? It does have a sway for me. I understand that. But ultimately, I also understand that universities have huge reserves and rainy day funds that they save for emergency services exactly like this that they have in their operating budget that ultimately they're just not tapping into and continuing to allow to collect interest. Sophia, any break in tuition or sundry fees for you? I know we have deferred um, some fee payments and the university has extended service fee charges. Um, so in that case, we have gotten some leeway. 
But as for the overall cost of tuition, it is the same for previous years. What do you think about the fact that the tuition is the same, but the experience is quite different? It is a little disappointing. And now that I get here, I can realize it even more. Um, I'm definitely not getting the same experience I would as in person. As Hoban mentioned, um, there's a lot of services and uh, facilities that I'm not using. I haven't been to the athletic center once yet since I've um, started university and I haven't been to libraries all as much as I've wanted to. Um, so it's uh, definitely difficult to see that I'm paying as much as somebody in previous years would have. However, my experience in university goes as far as my laptop. <laughs> right. Uh, an engineering degree, I think, now you correct me if I'm wrong here, I think costs more than, say, a general arts, a bachelor of arts degree. Is that right? Yes, it what is you, um, what are you a little paying? bit more. Uh, roughly around 15000 for tuition a year. 15000 Okay. And now the university's position would be, you know, at the end of the day, the experience might be different, but the piece of paper you're going to get is the same as everybody else's, and therefore you should have to pay the same amount. Does that argument have any sway with you? It does have some sway because it is true. Um, I do get the same piece of paper, after all, as any other um, engineer would. However, as of right now, I haven't had any labs in person um, in comparison to other years. I haven't had, you know, the one-on-one ex -on -one experience the socialization that I get from in-person classes. And I feel like that is definitely a major um, component into the engineering course. Hmm. Brandon, what's the financial hit for you like? Still paying the same prices. Uh, unfortunately for us in Aurelia, uh, our YMCA is permanently shut down and that was our recreation facility. So we're in a bit of a unique position um, with that one. But in terms of all the other fees, we're still paying the same amount. And frankly, I understand, you know, the reality is universities and colleges still have to keep the buildings running. They still have to pay staff. Uh, they, there's still administrative costs. Um, the larger problem is just that the province last year cut $680 million from post-secondary institutions uh, and, and $80 million from colleges. And then, you know, students are still paying uh, a lot of the upfront cost of post-secondary institutions. So it goes back to the point that th this, that what we're facing right now doesn't exist inside a bubble. And uh, I don't think the province uh, has shown any willingness to respond to that fact. I think if the Minister of Finance were here, he would say, we didn't actually cut their budgets. What we did was we cut tuition by 10%. Now, the effect of that was to starve the post-secondary institutions to the tune of 600 million plus that you pointed out. Um, but for what it's worth, the Minister of Finance would say, I didn't cut them, I gave students a break. You see it that way at all? Uh, I would disagree with the Minister of Finance on that one. Uh, yes, we did see a 10% decrease in our tuition, uh, but we also saw um, a real hit to our institutions, which meant a decrease in the quality of our education. So in the long run, it didn't actually make a difference. What the province should be looking at is decreasing tuition over time to truly make a, a difference for students in terms of that cost to education, which at this point, you know, post-secondary is as essential as a high school degree a diploma was 30 years ago. And uh, they should be increasing the funding to post-secondary institutions for research, for, uh, you know, equipment, for uh, supports and for more faculty. That way our education can really be world-class. Actually, let me get the financial story from you. Are you paying the same as you would if you were going to classes? Um, so I, I would say I am paying the same. I'm personally in a very fortunate situation that I'm part of the funded cohort. So I have my tuition um, and all the ancillary fees are completely covered by my department at the University of Toronto. Having said that, I do feel for students, both international as well as domestic students who are in the self-funded program, I think for them, it is a lot of pressure because on one hand, the likely employment opportunities that they had outside and on campus would have decreased. But at the same time, um, overall, there's a net increase in tuition over the past few years. Let's just see if we can get a better understanding of what campus life is like right now. Uh, Sophia, I'm going to start with you because uh, I went to University of Toronto as well uh, 42 years ago. My goodness. Okay. <laughs> 42 years ago, and my recollection was the engineering students back then were a bunch of rabble-rousing crazy heads. 
And, uh, you know, the Lady Godiva Memorial Band and, uh, you know, painting the testicles of the horse in Queen's Park on the statue pink and all sorts of crazy stuff. Did you get to do any of that stuff this year? You know what? It's funny you mentioned that because I did get to do some of it, although not quite the same as previous years. We got a little frosh kit in the mail, and in there came anything that we would need to do all those traditions through Zoom. So I got a little horse where we could paint the horse on our own. Um, I got a little jar of face paint, and in the jar of face paint, we kind of painted our own face in the way that we wanted to. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily the same as previous years. They definitely tried to maintain the traditions and the spirit of, um, you know, Lady Godiva and Mr. Blue and Gold and, you know, all the fun traditions that we always had. They tried to keep them alive as much as possible. Did it work for you? Uh, I definitely got an experience. It was fun. It wasn't the same, I can imagine. Uh, but I still got to meet a few people online and uh, stay in the spirit, I guess. Hmm. Oh, do you actually get a chance to walk around the campus of Western University? Yes, I do a little. So I was actually on campus yesterday doing a little project for the newspaper. And it's really weird. It's so quiet. I'm used to it being a huge, bustling, kind of beating heart of London City. And I'm around there and I'm maybe seeing 100 people pass me by in four hours. Um, yeah, it's now, quiet and it's eerie. <laughs> not what you had in mind, I guess. I think when I knew we were in a pandemic, it is similar to what I had in mind. If anything, there are maybe even more people than I would expected to have been on campus. Western is running a 20 to 30 percent of its courses in person this semester, which means we do have some on campus activity. That said, it's a stark comparison from one year to the next, where it used to be a student hub of activity constantly happening and initiatives constantly happening. Mm -hmm. And now it's just kind of quiet. You know, Western was one of the few universities that actually said it was going to reopen and put students on campus. And then, of course, as you pointed out, those outbreaks took place and they had to shut everything down. And I wonder whether you're more ticked off about the fact that they sort of, you know, opened and gave people, as it turns out, a false sense of hope as to what the year would be like, only to take it away. I would say, from my perspective, the experience didn't change that much after the shutdowns, at least personally. So what we had before the shutdowns was some in-person club meetings on campus, um, as well as our athletic centers. Hmm. Um, that was really it. Our libraries are still open as they were before, as is the access to campus buildings and kind of our little eateries. Some of them are still open for pick up and take out, which is what most people were doing anyway. Most people were not doing the dine and eating options. Um, that say, to bring back to part, the second part of your question is, I am a little ticked off that these in-person clubs meetings and stuff and our orientation week did have many in-person components, many more than were advertised. And I am a little ticked off that it did go that way. I think there is no proof that spread of the virus happened on campus. That said, I think it was a completely unnecessary risk, especially given Western's culture. Before the pandemic of a party school, I don't think you can expect that to change overnight just because of the pandemic. And I think the administration should have been better prepared and should have anticipated that and ultimately should have probably had a safer back to school plan for us. Well, I'm afraid that's our time, but I certainly do on behalf of, I'm sure everybody watching this, uh, wish you eventually at some point in your scholastic post-secondary careers, a nice normal university post-secondary experience that you're paying for. I hope eventually you get it. Hope, Brandon, Sophia, Akshay, it's great of all of you to join us on TVO tonight, and good luck. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.